there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. The 20th century saw the dawn of a new type of warfare. Machines ruled the battlefield. Conventional infantry assault across no man's land was bound to fail. Flesh and blood simply could not get through that type of defense. A fierce arms race led to even more deadly weapons. Those gunners on the tanks had rounds in their cannons, and they were ready to execute if they were told to. Behind the lines, the development of powerful and innovative vehicles meant the difference between victory and defeat. This is absolutely one of the unsung heroes of the Second World War. The relentless pursuit of military supremacy would lead to machines capable of destroying humanity itself. There are very few mistakes you could make that wouldn't have some kind of catastrophic consequence. This time, October 1961, the world holds its breath as a tense standoff at the Berlin Wall threatens to escalate into all-out nuclear war. For the crews in the standoff at Checkpoint Charlie, the situation was absolutely terrifying. They were facing each other off at point-blank range. The fear of a potential large-scale conflict leads East and West to build combat machines for the atomic age. The US Army is trying to adapt itself to fight on a nuclear battlefield. The results are fearsome and innovative instruments of war. A war that begins as a conventional war in the nuclear age can go to very, very dangerous places. of final surrender, the news that peace had at last been won, penetrated to every corner of the globe. Peace, the hope of mankind, had arrived. The end of World War II in 1945 should have marked a new era of peace and prosperity in Europe. Instead, the victors carved up the war-torn continent between them, and old allies turned into bitter enemies. While well, the Soviet Union brought most of Eastern Europe under its influence with the Warsaw Pact, France, Britain, most of Western Europe, and America and Canada formed their own alliance called NATO. Defeated Germany was split in two along this ideological divide. Both the Russians and the Western powers were very, very scared of a reunified Germany being grafted onto one or the other power blocks. By the late 1940s, the mistrust between East and West gave rise to a Cold War. And by the summer of 1961, as American President John F. Kennedy and Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev met in Vienna, East-West relations were at breaking point. And in June 1961, Khrushchev and Kennedy met in Vienna for a summit which really goes down in history for as being a disaster for Kennedy. It's where Khrushchev really tried to bully Kennedy, to intimidate him, and to make uh, fresh threats over the status of Berlin. Berlin had become the epicenter of Cold War tensions. The presence of NATO-controlled West Berlin deep inside Soviet-controlled East Germany, had become a major thorn in Khrushchev's side. The East German regime was hemorrhaging talented people. Thousands of professional, trained East Germans were leaving their country, were fleeing to the West, through West Berlin. This is a propaganda disaster. Khrushchev is the leader of what he claims to be a socialist and workers' paradise in the East. If that's true, why are the workers leaving in such large numbers? Khrushchev must do something about Berlin. He essentially says, I don't want you, the West, in West Berlin anymore. I want you to go, and if you don't go, I'll make you go. 
Kennedy refused to back down to Khrushchev's demands over Berlin. Um, instead, he actually began to mobilize American resources even more for potential confrontation in Berlin. The confrontation, when it came, was likely to be fought with both nuclear and conventional forces. For the US, this meant the introduction of their cutting-edge M48 Patton tank. The US Army knew how fundamental the Soviet tank regiments were to its Cold War military strategy. So if it was going to have any chance of victory in a Cold War conflict, it needed a formidable new tank of its own. So the M48 is actually building on a series of American developments that's been going on through the Second World War. And in many ways, the American way of looking at it is evolution, not revolution. We start the Second World War really with three main types of tank. There's light tanks um, for scouting, there's heavy tanks to help the infantry break through a fortified position, and then you have medium tanks that go through the gap. Now, as the war progresses, two of those types, the medium tanks and the heavy tanks, almost come together to end up with what we call a universal tank that does all the roles we want. On paper, the M48 was not much bigger or faster than its World War II predecessor, the M26 Pershing. Its critical advantage was its increased durability under enemy fire. This was achieved by casting the hull and turret sections as single pieces of reinforced steel. If you cast armor, it's inherently stronger than welding or riveting armor together, because then you've got joints, you've got issues there of breakages. Certainly with riveted armor, if something hits it, bits might fly off. They've now got the technology for that level of castings, which is not easy to do. To further increase the M48's protection on the battlefield, engineers from Chrysler also added some clever aerodynamics. You see very clearly when you look at it from the front, this boat-shaped design hull. And the idea of curving the underside of a vehicle is that if we drive over a mine and the blast is captured underneath the tank, it can flip it over and that causes real problems. If you can vent the blast up the side of the vehicle, that blast is dissipated. So we end up with the M48, this amazing boat-shaped cast hull and a huge cast turret. In Berlin, the M48s were about to be used in a very specific and critical role. On the 13th of August, 1961, the diplomatic crisis reached its peak. That morning, hundreds of East German construction workers assembled on the border between East and West Berlin. The Soviet Union, working with the East Germans, begins constructing the Berlin Wall. The wall, the barrier down the heart of Berlin, was designed in the first place to prevent the East Germans crossing into the West. For Khrushchev, this, at least, stops the refugee problem, the hemorrhage of talent of young people. It's the worst thing what's going to happen to Berlin. It's not only dividing our town, it's dividing the German country as a nation. For John F. Kennedy, I think there is a real sense of relief. The West maintains its position in West Berlin. And as Kennedy himself put it, a wall is a hell of a lot better than a war. But even with the new wall in place, Berlin remained a potential powder keg. Under the post-war agreement, representatives of each occupying nation could travel freely between each other's sectors of control. Now that the wall had created a barrier through the heart of Berlin, it was unclear whether this agreement would still be honored. US diplomats maintained that they had the right, as diplomats, to cross over into East Berlin. And indeed, in the period from August through to October, a number of diplomats were trying to test whether that was indeed the case. Increasingly, though, they found themselves being turned back by border guards. US diplomats were being somewhat provocative. They were poking a stick into the Soviet hive to see what kind of response there would be. The only way to cross the border into East Berlin was through a series of heavily guarded military checkpoints. The US nicknamed theirs Checkpoint Charlie. 
Vern Pike was the officer in charge of Checkpoint Charlie the day the Berlin Wall went up. Well, the, the wall just cut a knife through the heart of Berlin. That brought the focus home very clear that the Soviets, although they were allies, they were not. They were our adversary. The East Germans began to try to exercise control over Allied vehicles, and that was a no-no. We had no relations with the East Germans at all. We were occupying power, as were the Soviets, as were the British, as were the French. And so all actions that we took, we took with the Soviets, not with the East Germans. And that began to raise the tension levels. America refused to recognize the authority of the East German government. So when US diplomats were stopped at the border by East German guards, Kennedy's special advisor in Berlin, General Lucius Clay, ordered military police escorts for US vehicles to ensure their entry into East Berlin. We took in a military police alert squad of 18 and 19 year olds, 12 soldiers, in three Jeeps escorting this American civilian vehicle with US forces plates. And we escorted them through the barricades into the Soviet sector, turned them loose, they drove around and brought it back. We did that 15 times. As a show of force, Clay also sent a platoon of M48 tanks towards Checkpoint Charlie to back up the military escorts. We sometimes use tanks in situations militarily they're not actually suitable for, but because they symbolize strength and they have that domineering effect, there's a psychological impact with the tank, that's probably why the Americans sent them to the checkpoint. On the 27th of October, 1961, Vern Pike and his men were back at their station after yet another escort mission into East Berlin. On a Friday afternoon at 4 p.m., I'm again at Checkpoint Charlie. We had just released a platoon of our tanks that were there as a show of force to go back to Tempelhof Air Base. Suddenly, the rumble of tanks drowned out the noise of the afternoon traffic. However, these were not the US M48s. These tanks were bearing down on Checkpoint Charlie from East Berlin. I'm there with uh, Major Tyree, who was the uh, tank company commander. And we looked across Friedrichstrasse. And there were tanks coming towards Checkpoint Charlie. We don't know whether they're Soviet or East German because they've covered over all the bumper, bumper markings and they've got these black leather jackets with no insignia of rank or unit designation. We don't know. Though the tanks were unmarked, there was no doubting what they were. These were the legendary Soviet T-54s. A combat machine specially built to fight in a new era of warfare. At the height of the Cold War, tensions were growing in divided Berlin. In the late afternoon on October 27, 1961, 10 Soviet T-54 tanks were making their way toward Checkpoint Charlie, the American border crossing between East and West Berlin. On duty that day was Vern Pike. When those tanks started roaring, you got a, uh, a, t a tightness in your gut because now, now we're about to face reality. We had always been concerned about some kind of a confrontation taking place. And apparently, this was it. The direct counterpart to the American M48 pattern, the T-54, was the product of the Marazov Design Bureau, the same people behind the legendary Soviet World War II tank, the T-34. The Soviets have learned lessons from the Second World War. And what they needed in the main battle tank was a good all-rounder. So what the Soviets did is produce a single tank type that does everything. With a modernized engine and transmission system, extra fuel tanks, and infrared sights for night combat, the T-54 was a highly dependable and extremely versatile battle tank. 
Physically, the most striking difference to the T-34 was the turret. The T-34 design had an issue with shot traps. These were areas where stronger armor in the turret would deflect incoming shells to less armored parts of the tank, like the top of the hull. The hemispherical turret of the T-54 eliminated this design flaw. But the new turret also allowed the designers to install a larger gun and achieve their main goal with the T-54, more firepower. Firepower is what a tank is all about. It's really about defeating whatever the average enemy armor is with a frontal shot. Initially, the Soviets jumped a lead on, the, uh, on NATO uh, with the T-54 simply because it carried a much larger gun than NATO tanks. The T-54 was armed with 100 mm whereas its contemporaries of the time, such as the M48, only had a 90 mm So initially, it had greater stopping power. At 30 miles per hour, the T-54 evenly matched the M48 for speed. But thanks to the ingenuity of its Russian engineers, the T-54 was able to create its own smokescreen by injecting raw diesel into its engine. These features combined to make the T-54 a formidable weapon. But its real strength was in numbers. Over 40,000 T-54s were built making it the most highly produced tank in history. Ten of these imposing combat machines were now rolling down Friedrichstrasse in Berlin towards Checkpoint Charlie. Major Tyree says, Vern, get my tanks back here. So I get into my MP car and I go back up to Tempelhof. His executive officer was Captain Bob Lanfear. Bob, we got trouble at Checkpoint Charlie, follow me. He turns the tanks around, back we go to Checkpoint Charlie. The ante gets ratcheted up to the point that American M48's tanks are sent to Checkpoint Charlie to sit there with their engines gunning, and the Americans have been told, fire if you are fired on. Moments later, the 10 T-54s pulled up to face down 10 American M48s. Across Checkpoint Charlie, 20 tanks were now locked in a dangerous standoff. But the question remained, who was commanding these T-54s? The East Germans or the Soviets? I'm a 24-year-old lieutenant, and my orders are identify the tanks. So we get in a US military sedan, drove through the baffles, went around back behind the tanks and got out. There's nobody around. So I climbed up in the tank. I dropped down into the driver's compartment and there was acrylic script on the instrument panel. And the driver left a Red Army newspaper. So we went back, got in our vehicle, went back to Checkpoint Charlie and I told the colonel they were Soviet tanks. The Americans might have considered engaging the T-54s if they had been East German, as they were not permitted to deploy tanks in Berlin under post-war agreements. However, the tanks were Soviet. And this presented the Americans with an even more precarious situation. One false move could have triggered World War III. Our tanks deployed, their tanks came up, and everybody goes, they take a big gulp and say, OK, now what? what what's next? And those gunners on the tanks, they were ready. They had uh, rounds in their, in their cannons, and they were ready to execute if they were told to. They are giving the order, if you are fired on, you can fire back. We are not going to back down in this incident. To begin with, both the Kremlin and the White House were not particularly desirous of backing down instantaneously. There is uh, an issue of prestige here, and prestige is a very unquantifiable concept, but it's really important to superpowers. It sounds almost like uh, a comedic, blackly humorous moment, but it could have had deadly consequences. With the Americans and Soviets locked in a bitter standoff, it was a situation which could have escalated at any moment. Basically, they were facing each other off at point-blank range. If they'd opened fire, there would have been no survivors on the tanks that were hit. 
The situation at Checkpoint Charlie was very, very, very tense. Uh, and for a brief moment, it almost looked like the Third World War was going to break out. Across the globe, American forces were put on alert. But if the standoff had tipped the world over the edge into an all-out conventional war, the Americans would have been at a distinct disadvantage. Now, the communists at the time, led by Soviet Russia, are building many tens of thousands of tanks. So it becomes a bit of a numbers game. At the M48, 11,700 of them ultimately built. That's an awful lot of tanks when you think of production numbers. It's still a tiny amount when you actually look at the Soviet side and the many more tens of thousands they're building. The Soviets had so much equipment, so many men in that area, and that in itself, in tank warfare in the end, it doesn't matter how good your tank is, if you're swamped by the enemy, that is going to be the deciding factor. This discrepancy in numbers was partially the result of almost a decade of reforms in US defense spending, started by Kennedy's predecessor, President Dwight D. Eisenhower. Hoping to spend money on social programs and reduce taxes after the war, Eisenhower decided to reduce the military size. But with Cold War tensions mounting, America needed to maintain significant power to defend itself and Western Europe. Under the Eisenhower administration's new look national security strategy, there is a nuclearization of America's approach to the Cold War. The idea behind the new look was a smaller military that packed a bigger punch, a nuclear one. Sergeant Gutierrez, you've seen a lot of action. Tell us what just exactly how this thing looked to you. Think it's much of a weapon? I think it is, sir. But by the 1950s, the Soviet Union also had nuclear weapons. And any conflict between the two sides could quickly spiral into nuclear war. For a time then, in 1961, it looks like Berlin could be the catalyst for war between the United States and the Soviet Union, between East and West, and a war that begins as a conventional war in the nuclear age can go to very, very dangerous places. By the late 1950s, NATO forces found themselves in a cold war with the Soviet Union and its Warsaw Pact allies. American President Dwight D. Eisenhower had decided to slim down the military. However, the fear of a Soviet invasion of Western Europe meant NATO had to be ready to take on the huge Soviet army with a new set of deadly combat machines. The only thing to compensate for this conventional disparity was the fact the United States had a very, very strong strategic nuclear force. And in fact, that force, of course, was um, encapsulated in Strategic Air Command, SAC. The US Strategic Air Command was in charge of America's growing strategic nuclear arsenal. The real point of these weapons was not to fight a war at all. It was to actually deter a war. An enemy who would dare attack us would feel the punishment of devastating retaliation. Do you want to convey to your opponent that the idea of trying to resolve issues by force of arms is now likely to be just a calamitous, catastrophic error of judgment? Eisenhower believed that his strategic air command would be a far more cost-effective solution to maintaining military superiority for a cash-strapped America. With the majority of his defense budget diverted to the nuclear force, the role of the army in this new conflict now began to look uncertain. But Eisenhower realized that even in a nuclear war, the possibility of fighting a conventional conflict had to be anticipated. The expensive US army is run down, but a smaller, leaner, and meaner army is given tactical battlefield nuclear weapons in order to compensate in firepower for reduced numbers of manpower. In other words, we might not be bombing each other to oblivion, but we might be using smaller nuclear devices on the battlefield. 
Tactical nuclear weapons had much smaller yields than strategic bombs and missiles. They would not be used to decimate cities, but to wipe out groups of oncoming troops and machinery, forcing the enemy to fight through contaminated ground. The smallest of these was the Davy Crockett. The Davy Crockett small tactical battlefield weapon was developed from 1957 onwards. It was in the first instance a recoilless rifle which sat upon a tripod. In 1962, it's given a warhead, which has a destructive power of between 10 and 20 tonnes of TNT equivalents. Now, that is actually quite small. It's significant in a battlefield context, but it is, as a nuclear weapon, pretty small. Well, Davy Crockett was, you know, a, a woodsman. There was a, a story that one day he was out of ammunition, out hunting, and he came across a bear. So. To kill the bear, he, he grinned it down, he said. Well, the national animal of Russia was the bear. So hence, they named Davy Crockett to stare down the Russians. The bomb dropped on Hiroshima had a yield of 15 kilotons, or 15,000 tons of TNT. It would destroy all of Central Park in New York, an area over two miles wide. The Davy Crockett's yield of 20 tons of TNT would only destroy an area of 650 feet wide, but emit lethal radiation to an area half a mile wide. This is my uh, 1952 Willys, uh, it's an M38A1D. It has a Davy Crockett nuclear launcher mounted on it. It's basically a nuclear weapon that can be fired by a infantry squad, but it can be removed from the Jeep and carried by three men into the field. One man carries the barrel, somebody else carries the nuclear warhead on their back in a backpack. The weapon was muzzle loaded, powder charge went in, launching cylinder went in, warhead went on top and locked the launching cylinder, and then it was fired electrically. Launching cylinder and the warhead came out and separated in flight and the warhead went on and detonated. Weighing in at only 76 pounds and 31 inches long, the Davy Crockett projectile was a highly mobile and flexible nuclear bomb delivery system. Mounted on regular Jeeps, the three-man Davy Crockett team would be able to react quickly to enemy movements. They would all be self-contained, able to maneuver independently in the battle space when necessary to reconcentrate and to advance. What was unique about it was the fact that it was so small and it was basically under the command of just regular troops. The uh, orders to fire were at the battalion level. Uh, it didn't have to come from a general. It would come from the battalion commander of the Davy Crockett unit. Uh, the weapon was actually employed by enlisted men. There were no officers on the actual gun itself. Combat machines like the Davy Crockett were designed to allow NATO forces in Europe to hold up any mass attack, giving time for their tanks to get mobilized, as well as hopefully evening the odds. It was basically an area denial weapon to hold off the Russians till the rest of the army could get there. If we sent enough Davy Crockett's up there, fired enough warheads, it would stop the advance or at least slow the advance down because it was determined that it would take 48 hours to get an entire armored division up and running and move up to that area. And one place where the Allies felt the Davy Crockett's might have an important part to play was in Germany. Especially its capital, Berlin, where by 1961, NATO forces were under threat from the Soviets. When you actually look at it, the American forces and NATO forces in Berlin, it's a surrounded garrison. They would not have been able to last very long if it had come to an all-out fight against the Soviet forces surrounding them. Between 1961 and 1971, the US Army's atomic units had deployed over 2,000 of these tactical nuclear devices with units policing the borders of Europe. The power of this combat machine was demonstrated during the Little Fella tests. On July 17, 1962, in the Nevada desert, 
the Davy Crockett was put through its paces. They saw the weapon fire from the tripod mount and then the detonation downrange. It detonated perfectly, releasing its lethal radiation. And which was followed with uh, 4th Infantry Division troops sweeping through the area that had just been irradiated, which is what would have happened on the actual battleground. You would have had our troops moving through. In testing, however, the accuracy of this warhead was pretty poor, and in due course, although it was employed potentially by the US Army right up into the 1970s as a potential weapon, it was regarded more for its radiation-emitting value than its actual explosive properties. It could do great damage with its radiation to enemy concentrations. The effects of radiation had been tested years earlier between 1951 and 1957 during the Desert Rock exercises in Nevada. The Desert Rock exercises were an example of trying to train American soldiers to fight and survive on a nuclear battlefield. The tests would start with the detonation of an actual nuclear weapon. Then, once the mushroom cloud is in the sky, the idea was that you would then send your forces in to mop up whatever was left. That kind of exercise needed to be trained for. And you can well imagine how unnerving it would be for an American soldier to um, be told that he now has to march towards a mushroom cloud when you know, the same person would probably run very, very fast in the opposite direction. But not just soldiers were subject to these harsh conditions. So too were combat machines, including the M48. They actually put tanks a kilometre or so away from a nuclear blast. With the M48, they don't actually put anti-nuclear sealant on the vehicle. Some are blown over. Um, they estimate the crews inside would have been killed if they were that close. It's going to be another generation before we make those vehicles seriously uh, nuclear, biological and chemically sealed so there's a chance they could really survive on the battlefield. The Russians reached the same conclusion. The next combat machines needed to be capable of fighting on a battlefield with nuclear, biological and chemical weapons, or NBC protection. Ironically, at that point, when there was a, a very tense standoff uh, over Checkpoint Charlie in uh, Berlin, the Soviets were beginning to produce a Model 1961 T-55 tank that was fully kitted with an NBC protection system, which clearly indicated they were contemplating uh, the likelihood of them having to fight a nuclear war. By the time evening fell on October 27, 1961, the showdown between American and Soviet tanks at Checkpoint Charlie had reached a stalemate. While these two iconic tanks were locked and loaded in deadly standoff, the United States and the Soviet Union were busy trying to develop a new generation of combat machines fit for the nuclear battlefield. While one would become the workhorse of many a conflict, the other would not make it past its testing phase. By the early hours of the 28th of October 1961, 10 American M48 Patton tanks and 10 Russian T-54s had been locked in a standoff at Checkpoint Charlie for 12 hours. Behind the scenes, frantic attempts were being made to broker peace between Kennedy and Khrushchev and to de-escalate the situation. But commanders on the ground had other ideas. During the tank standoff at Checkpoint Charlie, the United States government is also dealing with a general, General Clay. He has his own ideas on how a local issue can be resolved, and he's not entirely happy to be told what to do by faraway American politicians. It's a little reminder that it only takes a hothead on the spot in a local situation in the Cold War for something to go very badly wrong. 
it isn't always a case of presidents and leaders controlling every situation with perfect finesse. While the diplomats and politicians were busy trying to avoid conflict, the military engineers were busy working on the next generation of combat machines for the nuclear battlefield. And the Americans were thinking outside the box. Why have just a Jeep when you could have an air Jeep? The Piasecki Air Jeep was commissioned in 1957, and by the time of the Berlin standoff, this flying combat machine was close to completion. Its uh, purpose was to have, see if it could be a replacement for the Jeep that was being used by the Army at that time. The general concept behind it was it was going to be sort of a, a personal a flying utility vehicle. It would take two crew, uh, could carry up to three passengers. One of the key things was that it was designed for vertical takeoff and landing. It has the two vertical shaft uh, rotors, uh, but it has two engines to it as well. Uh, but it was designed so that if one of the engines was to fail, then both of the rotors would still be able to work on the remaining operating uh, engine. Designed as a reconnaissance vehicle or a weapon carrier, it could be mounted with a recoilless rifle, including the Davy Crockett nuclear launcher. The air jeep itself could fly up to about 85 miles an hour. The highest flight was about less, a little less than 3,000 feet. Uh, but it was not designed to fly actually that high. It was designed to fly along the ground using what they call ground effects, about 25 to 30 feet off the ground. One of the um, key features of the air jeep, of course, was that it could fly very, very low. It could do nap of the land operations, uh, which meant it could fly quite happily undetected by enemy radars. But unfortunately, although the air jeep had the capability of flying under the radar, it couldn't carry the loads that new helicopters were able to, and the project was shelved. It was one of those designs that was neither here nor there. By the late 1950s and certainly in the 1960s, uh, steps were being taken to develop quite highly effective helicopter troop carriers and indeed helicopter gunships. But the issue of mobility across a nuclear contaminated battlefield would continue to preoccupy military strategists on both sides of the Cold War. Eventually, Russia came up with a design for a combat machine which would turn the odds in their favor. The BMP-1. BMP-1 uh, was a hybrid between a tank and an armored personnel carrier. Now, the BMP-1 actually looks a bit like a tank, so it had a turret with a gun, but also a troop compartment at the back to carry infantry. Uh, so it was designed to fight at the forward edge of the battlefield, supporting Soviet tanks. Having lacked an armored troop carrier in World War II, the Russians resolved to create a vehicle that could transport soldiers safely across a nuclear battlefield. Had war broken out, the intention was uh, Soviet tank fleets would simply overwhelm NATO, and obviously to keep the infantry close with the tanks, they needed something to be transported in. And also, in the event of NATO using tactical nuclear weapons, uh, the BMP had to be able to withstand that, and therefore was designed with a nuclear biological chemical protection system, that if it detected a, a sizable blast in the neighborhood, the machine itself would shut down, it would pressurize itself to give the crew some chance of withstanding uh, radiological or chemical contamination. A combination of armored personnel carrier and light tank, the BMP-1 could reach a top speed of 40 miles per hour. But the key advantage was the ability for the troops inside to defend themselves without having to leave the safety of the protected interior. The infantry could actually fight from inside it as well as obviously getting out to engage enemy infantry. But on the battlefield, they could actually fight batten down inside it. Uh, it had uh, rifle ports on the sides. In the turret, it had a 73 millimeter anti-tank gun designed to take on enemy armored fighting vehicles or tanks. And it had another key attribute that would make it a formidable combat machine in a potential European war. 
One of the requirements for the BNP was it to be uh, fully amphibious. The Soviets had probably learned lessons from the Second World War, uh, particularly when it came to crossing Europe's rivers, and therefore you need to get your armoured vehicles across very, very quickly uh, without having to wait for bridging equipment. So the BNP was capable of swimming. Once the BMP-1 was introduced in 1966, it became a stalwart of the Cold War era. On the 28th of October 1961, American M48 and Soviet T-54 tanks were still facing off after more than 16 hours at Checkpoint Charlie. But while the tank engines were running hot, so were the phone lines. Once the danger of a showdown, maybe even a shooting showdown, was recognised, there was feverish diplomatic activity behind the scenes in Moscow and Washington. With neither side wanting to risk war, Kennedy and Khrushchev reached an agreement to de-escalate the situation by ordering a simultaneous withdrawal. I don't know what was going on between the commandants, but when I was down at Checkpoint Charlie, the Soviet tanks just went in reverse and, and, de and departed. And as they departed, so did ours. It just kind of happened. You know, there wasn't some formal ceremony, you know, to say, situation is resolved, crisis over. It just happened F from where I sat, you know, at Checkpoint Charlie. That tank standoff lasts for 16 hours. That is a long time. That is a long time of tension. And in the end, okay, things are resolved. The diplomats get together and the two governments accept that uh, we, need to, uh, we need to be calm and measured in this and pull back a little bit from the brink. Although US General Clay had been sent to Berlin to stand up to Soviet aggression, his decision to escalate a diplomatic border issue into a tense standoff was too dangerous for Washington. After the Checkpoint Charlie incident, Lucius Clay is withdrawn because it seems as too risky. If we trigger a war with something like that, it's probably too risky a venture. No one knows what would have happened had shots been fired during those two days in October 1961. To simply say that good sense and wisdom and calm heads and measured judgments would have prevailed is all very well, but historians, not just historians, politicians, usually reflect back to 1914 and that moment in Sarajevo when an Austrian Archduke was assassinated, and that shows how a local event can generate continent-shattering consequences. While both the Americans and Soviets took a more restrained approach after the 1961 Berlin crisis, the city's unique situation would continue to be a source of tension in Cold War politics. It wasn't until the early 1970s when the SPD government under Willy Brandt began to deal with the East German government that tensions over Berlin were dissipated and so that Berlin was removed as a potential source of war between the Soviet Union and the United States. While combat machines like the M48, T-54 and BMP-1 would see action in conflicts all over the globe, none were used on a nuclear battlefield. The pace of technological change and the advent of intercontinental ballistic missiles would soon make the threat of conventional close quarters combat between the two superpowers all but obsolete. But the combat machines that were spawned from the fear of such a conflict became Cold War icons.